I love my audio system. I love just being a hermit. I mean, you guys know me. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else in the world. Hold on. I have to take this. So here we are in California, absolutely beautiful weather. Don't get this back home in Canada. Uh, but the reason I'm here is because Samsung invited us to their secret audio lab where they supposedly R&D all their like sound bars and like audio stuff for the TVs. And in fact, I searched on YouTube. It's their first time showing off this facility. I haven't seen any walkthroughs or tours of this facility. So I have no idea what to expect. All I know is that Samsung spends a lot of money on this facility for their sound bars and development. So I'm very excited to check it out. Came to California a little bit early so that we can enjoy the weather and we don't get back home. So we're gonna do some crazy stuff. Okay, so it's time to go to Samsung. You got the address there? Yep, yeah, I got the address. All right. It's like two hours away. Yeah. Let's roll. Is this the right place? <laughs> I don't know. Oh. Um. <laughs> okay. I'm not quite sure about this. Guess this is Samsung. Hey, how are you? Hey, how are you? It's good to see good you. Good to see you. So, welcome to uh, Samsung's Audio Lab in Valencia, California. I mean, as I'm walking, I'm seeing like a lot of these like artworks and like albums on the walls and stuff yeah so you guys really love this stuff so first of all everybody that here absolutely loves music i mean it's a pre-requirement you you don't get a job here if you don't love music um and so we wanted to let people know that we wanted to be a part of the lab and also it's just fun for us so when we built the lab we um i gave everyone the opportunity to put a couple of posters uh in the lab and then as a group we made sure that we got some of the classics and uh, you know, like that's my favorite YouTube album. It's kind of funny because everybody thinks Joshua Tree, but I mean, uh, Octon Baby, it's special, right? Because they definitely started doing something different at that time. I really love that album. So here they are. What, that, cool. that big container right there? Yeah, so these are the Anacoke chambers. You'll notice uh, they're big. And uh, you know, there's that old joke, right? Size matters. When it comes to Anacoke chambers, it really does. Okay. Let's go check them out. All right, let's go. go. <laughs> oh, wow. My ears just kind of pressure, just like, a, I mean, like a really dead sound. <laughs> Yeah, so it's so dead sounding, it feels like there's pressure on your ears, but of course the pressure is no different than it was outside the door. The door's open. Um, what's special about this anacoke chamber is a couple of, couple of things. First of all, it, it is using fiberglass, which is the best sound absorber. Um, and then the other thing is, is the way we designed the microphone can move on this boom up and down through the vertical plane. 
And then the speaker sits on the stand here and it can rotate through the horizontal plane. So we can measure any point around the loudspeaker to really understand how it's gonna light up the room with sound. So like all the off axis vertically and horizontally? Every point. Now I know that anechoic chambers are um, measured, uh, like rated for certain frequencies in the mm -hmm. low frequencies. What is this anechoic chamber rated for? This chamber is good to 80 Hertz. And below 80 Hertz, what we did was we measured a bunch of speakers outside in free space, and then we measured them in here, and we took the difference of each speaker inside and outside, and took the average of that to get a calibration curve. So we know we're getting good measurements, plus or minus a dB all the way down to 20 Hertz. Wow. And so when, when you are um, measuring speakers, what are you exactly looking for? Is it to like get transparent as possible? Is it the most neutral? Or yeah. do you it's the Samsung sound. What is what is that? So that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. That's a long answer. But a couple of the key points are, is that um, first of all, the most important thing is the amplitude response it needs to be flat. You know, you can't accentuate some tones and uh, push back other tones. You want it to be neutral. And that needs to be the direct sound that goes directly to the microphone in the chamber or to your ears when you're in a sound room and you're listening but also for the off-axis sounds, the sounds that are bouncing off side walls and the floor and ceiling, they have to be nicely balanced as well. And so with our automated measurements, moving the microphone and moving the speaker, we can characterize the way the speaker is energizing the whole room with sound, that direct sound and earlier arrivals that bounce off some of the boundaries and the later ones and make sure they're all balanced. And you have two of these. And we have two of these. This one's specialized for speakers that aren't too close to the walls. The other one's designed specifically for speakers that are close to the walls. For example, TVs and sound bars. Um, so. What, what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> You'll see, you see that thing right there? Yeah. This... We're, gonna bring the we're gonna bring this over so you can see exactly what's going on. This is pretty wild though. It, there's literally nothing like Ooh. this in the world. This is completely unique. <laughs> so this guy can get held there. <laughs> we don't need to do it. Um, so, <laughs> we got, we'll, you'll figure it out. You'll, you know, good, good practice run. Um, so here's what's really unique about this chamber. This chamber has five surfaces with anechoic wedges, uh -huh. but this wall right here is solid. Okay. Okay. So imagine a speaker in a room. Right? And when it gets close to the back wall, it sounds different than if it's away from the wall. Right. So the wall behind the speaker really dramatically affects the sound quality of the speaker. So we decided to build a chamber that actually has that wall. Okay? So we open this door here and we can mount a TV to that door and then close the door and then measure the TV on a wall. And you can see an array of 17 microphones here yeah. and they're located uh, that one is at the center of the door, uh -huh. so that's obviously straight on axis, and then it's plus or minus 10 degrees all the way to plus or minus an 80, 100, you know, it's all, obviously you can't do 90 degrees because that's against the wall, so we go from 80, her, 80 degrees all the way to negative 80 degrees. Is that in case someone's like watching the TV on mounted to a ceiling? So no, but what it is, is, is sound bounces off the ceiling. Oh, okay. So you want to know what that sound is like as well as the sound that goes directly at the listener. Ah. And of course the direct sound is the most important, but the sound that bounces off the ceiling matters too. And so what's interesting here, this mic array in this position is measuring from floor to ceiling, but the whole mic array itself rotates and goes all the way plus or minus 100 uh, so to, to 80 entire, degrees. The whole thing rotates. Thing. Just goes back and forth. Back and forth. And so we measure around 289 measurements in about 10 minutes, all around the whole uh, half sphere outside the TV. Because again, it's a half sphere because it's sitting on a wall. Does, any, does anyone have to actually go in? No, we okay, don't so need nobody to. Climbs in no there. one needs to climb in here. There was only two guys that had to climb in here. And that was the two guys, I'm one of them, yeah. that had to put the last two wedges in the chamber and then somehow safely get out of the thing. So this is the second one. So, this so what's is the this rated one? for down? So this here. chamber is good to about 120 hertz. And then again, we calibrate it below that frequency. Wow. So this is mostly exclusive just for like TVs. TVs and sound bars. Because sound, sound bars can be close enough to the back wall 
that we want to include that measurement. So right, for some us, people mount it as well, right? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, soundbar that's mounted to the wall, absolutely the wall matters. Um, and the interesting thing is, is that, you know, we can learn what a soundbar does in this chamber and what it does in that chamber and understand how it's going to work in customers' homes, close to the wall or far from the wall. And we can build that in to make sure it sounds good, regardless of how a customer uses it. So how do you exactly mount it onto this wall here? Yeah. Do you know? So, yeah, it's no. pretty tricky. So most customers use the TV stand, right? Okay. Right. I mean, there's the legs on the TV right. and they put yeah. it on a credenza. So what we do is we have um, a fake credenza that mounts to this wall mm -hmm. and it has the surface area that a typical credenza would have. And then we actually mount the TV to the wall using a regular TV mount. And we'll mount it at a distance that a customer would typically put it as if it was on its feet. So we kind of simulate foot mounting and we have to do it that way because when you close this door, if it was just on its feet on the credenza, it'd just fall over <laughs> into the chamber. So obviously we can't do that. So that's the best way that we've been able to simulate the stand, the stand mounted version. And then of course, for just wall mounting, we just wall it, mount it to this wall like a customer would, close the door and do the measurements. Has, was there ever a TV that fell in here? No, we have not dropped a TV in here. Just take a quick look. Those wedges are still in great shape. Yeah. Yeah, we haven't dropped one yet. Okay. It'll happen sooner or later. Now that you've brought it up, you probably jinxed it. It's going to happen next week. <laughs> I'm ACDC and Muse, by the way. I play it all the time. I love that. Yeah, you know what? We had um, friends visiting from Australia. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a gift, they, they brought that poster because they had, they had already known about our love of these things. So they wanted to have something that we could remember them by. I love it. It's like everywhere. Like... Oh, everywhere. What's it this room? Is. So this is the largest of our three listening rooms. Okay. Let's go inside. Listening room. Oh, wow. Look at these diffusers and absorption. Yeah, there's diffusion, absorption, reflection, it's all here. So gigantic. And it's all adjustable. So we did some analysis of what sizes our customers put our speakers in. You know, how big is, just how big is the room? Right. And when we designed the three rooms, we made sure that one room was at the average, one was at about the 75th percentile, and one's right between those. So we can simulate the size of the rooms that our customers are actually going to put the speaker speakers in. So you have this is the, so this is the biggest room. This is the biggest of the three. Yeah. And so. you mentioned that you can adjust these. Yeah. To take these off. Yes, yeah, so we on. can take them off. So you'll notice this is just a rail here. And there's a complementary rail on each one of these uh, diffusers or absorbers. So you can just pick them up and move them in and move them out and place them wherever you want. Is that to kind of emulate like the different room exactly. behaviors? We're trying to simulate different room acoustics. So some rooms are brighter sounding and some yeah. rooms are dead sounding. Um, and so by having adjustable acoustics and having adjust the three different sizes, we can simulate pretty much anything that our customer is uh, going to have at home. So the interesting thing is, you know, can we talk about room acoustics really yeah, quick? Yeah, sure, absolutely, very important. Is, yeah, really important. So, you know, there's, there's three things that basically happen in a room with sound. Um, the first thing is, is uh, reflection. And um, I think it's pretty simple, but maybe it's the easiest way for people to understand is sound is a lot like light. Mm -hmm. So when you look in a mirror, you see a reflection of yourself, so, you know, the light hits the mirror and comes back to you and it maintains the image. Well, that's just like a solid wall. So what happens is, you know, the sound from the speaker hits this wall, reflects and goes to, goes to you in the middle of the room. Mm -hmm. You hear that reflection, the image is retained. Mm -hmm. So that's a reflection. Um, so just like in light, if you have a black wall, a wall that's completely black, that's matte black, the light hits that and gets completely absorbed. That's like this, this is an absorbing panel, this is, fiberglass with cloths over it, so it absorbs most of the sound that hits mm -hmm. it, just like that matte black wall. The one that people don't really understand is this idea of diffusion, and I know you understand it. Um, but diffusion is really interesting. It's sort of like a white wall with that's a matte white. So it's not like a mirror. And what happens is, if you think about a matte white wall, light hits that wall and reflects back into the room, but the image is lost. And that's what these do. 
These are diffusers and they do the acoustic simulation of that. And so with having the right mix of reflection, absorption, and diffusion, you can vary the sound of the room. And of course, Good Rooms has a balance of all of those things. So like in a normal person's room, right? Um, like I'm an audiophile, I have diffusion and absorption mm -hmm. in my room, but you know, a lot of consumers don't, right? And especially in their entertainment room. Yeah. So is this to kind of emulate like the bookshelf they may have in the room? Yes, or the exactly. Carpet? So the great thing about most customers, most consumers' homes is that actual just lifestyle adds diffusion. Mm -hmm. um, a bookshelf, exactly. Um, you know, a media niche. Um, the refrigerator, the cabinetry, everything is adding diffusion because they're breaking up solid bits of wall. Right. Um, and the interesting thing is, is you see a lot of quote unquote sound rooms yeah. that don't have enough diffusion. They'll have a lot of absorption, they'll have reflection, but they don't have enough diffusion. Um, you heard him. You heard him. <laughs> I'm big on diffusion. That's why. It, it needs to be there. It really is an important part of the experience. Um, and again, most customers just by having plants and bookshelves and stuff like that, you have enough diffusion to get good sound. And of course, from absorption, a couch is a fantastic thing. And carpet. And, and, carpet. and carpet. Yeah, or a rug. <laughs> <laughs> so what is this room? I see general like speakers, multi-channel system going so on. So this is the middle of the, the three rooms in okay. terms of size. Mm -hmm. It happens to be the quietest. Um, we put a lot of extra effort into this room. It is, it's, it's our reference room. Sounds really good. Yes, it does. I mean, and this is kind of, you know, when we were in the other room, we're doing some experiments and so they weren't really set up optimally, but this room right now is, is, is set up well. Uh, there's that right balance of absorption and diffusion and reflection. And you can just even hear it just with you and me yeah. talking. Yeah. Hopefully the mic can pick that up, but it sounds really natural in here. Yeah. And that's what we want to be able to uh, see uh, past the room and actually listen to the speaker and way it interacts with a good room. Um, funny enough, you know, a speaker will interact with a room and a good speaker will sound better in more rooms. And you might get an example of a mediocre speaker in a, in a funky room and it'll sound okay. Um, but that's just a random incident. You know, to make your speaker sound good in many rooms means it has to sound good in good rooms first. Okay. Well, so like, what, is, what do you exactly do here with these Genelex speakers? So yeah, you'll see there's our, one of our current sound bars right. Uh, right there. We're literally comparing our sound bars to studio monitors. Um, you know, we, we don't see any value in comparing our sound bars to other sound bars other than just making sure that we are absolutely the best. But as we try to continue to improve the sound quality, we've got to compare against the reference standard. And you know, this is how the mixing suites are set up with high quality loudspeakers, with the speaker, with the height speakers and the main speakers in the proper location, with a whole pile of subwoofers so that the bass is clean and natural. So let me get this straight. So you play the sound bar and then you turn the sound bar off and then you play the multi-channel with the, all these speakers and then you compare the two. And we compare them. Yeah. We're comparing our sound bars to studio monitors. And is it does it get close? We're getting closer. Um, I'm not going to tell you we're equaling, <laughs> you know, studio monitors, uh, discrete speakers, but we're getting really close. And our goal every year is to get closer and closer. And is that the top secret soundbar you were talking about earlier? So no, this is actually a current soundbar. Oh, okay. So you this is our <laughs> 990C. Um, it's, it's a pre-production prototype. Mm -hmm. It is one that's gone through tuning and some of the life testing here. But yeah, it's a current soundbar. It sounds pretty good in here. So I've been looking for some research that I can share with you because okay. I know your your uh, your fans are gonna are gonna love this kind of stuff. They want to know what's coming up in the future, mm -hmm. and this is great because this is some research that we published in the Audio Engineering Society. And what we've done is we figured out a way to measure all the speakers at the same time, so you don't have to measure just the left speaker. Wait, do like five or six positions, and then do the right, and so on. Um, we measure all of them at the same time at once. And we have this specially designed test tone that allows the microphone to discriminate uh, each speaker. And then we can take the output of all the speakers and then separate them and analyze each speaker individually. So do you want to hear this test tone? Yes, but I don't know what he just said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be honest, that was 
<laughs> I was trying to wrap my head right. around it. Here we go. Okay. What just happened? So what happened is, is we put sine sweeps into the speakers, but we started them at different points in the sweep. So one of the speakers is going 20 to 20K, but another one starts in the mids, goes to high frequencies and it wraps around to low frequencies and comes back up. And that's why it gave it that fun kind of Star Trek-y sound. Yeah. And what that allows us to do, it allows us to separate the impulse response of each speaker in time. And then we just analyze the left speaker and the center speaker and the right, and we separate them out. And so we can measure all the speakers simultaneously. Wow. And so that's great for our customers. In a few years, what's going to happen is with just one tone like you just heard, you'll be able to calibrate your whole system. You don't have to do each speaker separately. And that's a laborious, challenging problem for someone that's not an audio expert. Wow. So this one test tone and you're set to go. And you're set to go. In the future. In the future. So here we have the Tune 990C soundbar. And we also have this a uh, whole setup with um, these Genelec loudspeakers. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to play 7.1.4 music um, without uh, Jay knowing uh, which one uh, is playing, the Genelec or the soundbar. And so let's and see. Then I'm going to try to guess which one it is. Hopefully. Let's do this. Okay, I'm going to close my eyes. Okay. All right. That was actually surprisingly very close. I'm kind of shook that that was that close. It, it second one was a soundbar. Yes. Okay. Oof. That was surprisingly close. I was like, um. <laughs> I was like, um. Honestly, what gave it away was like in the beginning of the track. Like I can tell that it's coming from here, so I'm assuming that's a soundbar. Yeah. But if you played it from like halfway through, when the you know the the music was halfway through. <laughs> There's a terrible explanation. <laughs> um, I, I honestly would have a much harder time because like that portion sounds like I, I hear stuff coming from the back. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we are striving to get our sound bars to sound like that, those studio monitors in a well-done room. And, um, you know, you get the timbre right, you get the locations right, uh, get the levels right, the delays right. Uh, a mo you know, a modest soundbar I think in Canada would retail for about two thousand dollars. I mean, that's that's a lot of money for some people, but for audiophiles, it's not, you know, it's not out of the question. Um, but the ease of use and um, the fact, you know, you know, you connect it to your Samsung TV, they work together, one remote control, give the customer that's willing to spend that much money really good sound and of course there are audiophile friends that have a full home theater they'll be jealous but they can go home and know that they've got something that's really good i mean how much is this sound bar so in the states it's like uh, 1700 um at the regular price versus um, oh god <laughs> i think these genelecs are a few thousand each right yeah so you know you're you're talking you know upwards of thirty thousand dollars just in the speakers yeah i'm impressed Nice little place to build your prototypes. Oh my goodness. Yeah. You have a CNC machine. We have a CNC machine in here that can do wood and uh, softer metals. It can do aluminum. Um, and of course we have a table saw and you know, we've got paint booth capabilities. We've got everything we need with the combination of our local 3D printers to make prototypes really quickly. Hey Slim 380. <laughs> <laughs> 
So this is, in this area, we're working on the transducers and, and the three rooms become more and more isolated from the rest of the lab because one thing about transducers is you're gonna beat the living daylights out of the thing, it's gonna be loud. Mm -hmm. So it's a, manage of, uh, a matter of uh, dealing with the sound that uh, that's gonna create. So in here, you know, you're looking at building prototype speakers, doing preliminary testing. Uh, we got strobes so we can look at breakup modes, uh, stuff like that. If we go in here, next room over, there's a bunch of transducer prototypes here. Wow. It's a lot of small drivers too. Yeah. I'm assuming those small drivers are for sound bars. Yeah. So this is a new transducer that we've been working on for the last about a year. Um, our current uh, transducers that we're using in most of the sound bars, they're 52 millimeters in this dimension. These are 48, so it's going to allow our sound bars to be just a little slimmer, a little less tall, um, and of course, 10% smaller, but keep the same performance. So it's a lot of work to get there. So we've been working on that for quite some time. Um, and we've got a tweeter that's got that same 48 millimeter dimension, and then this full range device that we use for surround channels or side channels. Um, that's also 48 millimeters. So basically all of them are the same size um, so that we can just get that soundbar as small as possible, but each transducer has been carefully optimized for the best possible performance. This guy is a little hero. Can you touch it? Yeah. Oh, it's actually, it's a, actually a lot heavier than I think it would be. You know, if you see the print for that, you might think it's like a 12 inch woofer. And then you see it in real life, it's, it's, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Oh my goodness. But it's a, it's a really serious little device. That little transducer can move plus or minus almost a full half inch. Wow. So it's really heroic. Over here is a laser scanner. Uh, two versions, one that can uh, scan surfaces of the transducer. It can rotate so we can get a full laser scan, see how the breakup modes are happening. And then this one is also um, mostly used for displacement measurements um, where we can map uh, the nonlinearities to mm -hmm. find out what's the cause of distortion. Is it a suspension problem? Is it a magnet problem? Um, is it the surround? Use that information to make the next iteration that much better. I see. Yeah. And then the last room, that's the just close the door and beat the living daylights out of the speaker room. So, you know, speakers will get loaded up and kilowatts of power will be put into them and we'll just uh, run them till failure. Is that out. the crossover that uh, goes into it? <sighs> you know, <laughs> there, every time you look in the, in the building, you're gonna find some little leftover part that didn't get put away. To be honest, I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember the last time we did a passive crossover in here. Wow. So I'm assuming the guy puts this yeah puts ear this protection. On. Get the speaker up and running. There's the equipment rack. Get it going. Close the door. Come back on Monday morning. Sorry, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> so there's, it's you know there's this four sided wall here um, that you know we can mount TVs or sound bars and they all get strapped in and then you know, it gets exactly in the right location, then we can close the door again. Because the difference, and we've talked about this, and, and you understand that, the difference between a really good, a good couple of speakers um, is about the difference of moving them roughly half a meter. So if you're not taking care of position, then you're not really learning what speaker sounds better. Right. Um, but when you think about a sound bar, all the speakers are running all the time. Right. You know, it's, you know, if it's a five channel soundbar or a seven channel soundbar or an 11 channel soundbar, whatever it is, you are energizing the whole system. We wanted to be able to compare the sound quality of our TVs easily, and we wanted to be able to compare the sound quality soundbars. And both of those products are used close to walls. And so what we did was we designed a section of wall um, that we can mount a TV on as big as a 75 inch TV and or a sound bar. And we can set up that system and it's now in this location, play some music, have the blind screen down and you're evaluating the sound of that product. When you've decided that that product's a seven or a five or a two, whatever score you're gonna give it, after you listen to that song, put your score on the tablet and you hit, you know, say we labeled that one A, you hit B, the music stops, the door is open, 
the whole assembly moves in about four seconds and then the music starts playing again and it's a new product mm. and the products in the exact same location and then what happens is is we usually use about four pieces of content um you know we've been listening to tracy chapman for how many years now uh fast car um and we do use that um but of course uh being a sound bar we'll use some cinematic content mm -hmm. as well properly chosen just like tracy chapman's right. was properly chosen um and when you play the next song we'll change what a b and c and d is and now there is no way the listeners doing some kind of fingerprinting every time they listen to a new song they've got to reevaluate the three or four products they're listening to it's a strenuous task and it's a difficult task but it really does give us real information and typically we need between 10 and 20 people to get statistical significance and when we do that when it's done we actually know how the product stands over a measure of the population not just a single person's opinion that is biased because it might be cited. We're doing it blind, we're doing many people, and we're doing good statistical analysis and scientific methods to really determine, have we made this product as good as it can be? Is it the best that's available? And we always strive for that. That's awesome. Um, so you mentioned 10 to 20 people. How do you pick those people out? Is it like people that work here? <clears throat> yeah. Or? So. Um, the, the, the good news is, first of all, um, if you have good hearing, as long as you don't have significant hearing loss, basically everyone has the same opinion. Um, what's different between someone that really has a good aptitude for it versus someone that doesn't is uh, someone that's uh, a novice or a rookie, whatever gentle term we want to use to describe mm -hmm. that person, they're going to give you a mean score of seven, but their standard deviation is going to be big. Right. Whereas the expert, the person who's been doing it for years, he's going to give you the same score. Or she's going to give you the same score, but the standard deviation is going to be lower. Mm. And what we have found is that inexperienced and experienced listeners give you the same mean answers. It's just experienced listeners give you a lower standard deviation. Got it. So you need less people to give you a solid answer at the end. But a trained listener and experienced listeners their opinion is the same as the novices. Mm. So what that means is, is if, if we want to know how good a speaker sound and we're going to use novice people, novice listeners, we might need 100. If they're trained and experienced, we might need 10 to 20. I see. So we get the same answer, we just get it faster with trained listeners. So what are all these microphones? Like there's... There's 15 <laughs> of them. 15, okay. There's 15 of okay, them. Three. One, two, three, four, five. Yes, 15. Okay, good. I'm <laughs> glad my math was right. I didn't want to be wrong. Um, so, um, so, interesting thing about measuring speakers in rooms. Um, people that know what they're doing know you never use a single microphone. Okay? Um, the reason for that is, is that response peaks and dips can happen due to resonance or they can happen due to reflection. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they can look the same uh, with a single microphone measurement but they sound dramatically different. What's interesting about doing a lot of measurements like these 15 is that when you average the response from these 15 is subtle differences at each location that are due to reflections average out and differences that are caused by resonances or problems in the speaker, you know, whether the resonances are in the speaker or in the room, it doesn't really matter. Um, will tend to show up in all the microphones. So when you average the 15 microphones, problems that are due to resonance pop out and problems due to reflections get diminished. And that's an so important it thing. So creates dips or rises. Exactly. Re response. Yeah. So these things can look the same with one measurement, with one microphone, but they look completely different with several microphones. Mm. And here's the interesting thing. People are like, you know, but you don't listen over an area. Your ears are at one location. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing I'll throw back at somebody that makes that argument. A couple of things. When you walk into a room and you just walk around the room and a, a speaker's playing music, does the speaker change in its sound quality much? You move two, three feet, sound basically the same, right? You've got experience in this, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't change much. You take a speaker and you move it two or three feet, does it change? Yes. A lot. Mm -hmm. The location where you are in the room 
the where the listener is, is actually not that important. Notwithstanding being stupid, like sticking your head in the corner, mm -hmm. but like when you're in the good zone, you're hearing the room and it basically sounds the same. Mm. So the idea of doing a measurement over an area makes a lot of sense when you consider multiple people listening, when you consider that idea that when you move, it doesn't change that much. But when the speaker moves, it changes a lot. Yeah, okay? In my room, I uh, take multiple measurements. When I don't have 15 microphones, mm -hmm. but I have you know, one microphone and, and I move them. move them around to make and then average them. So this is essentially that, as, as, except faster. Faster. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And larger. <laughs> yes. Do these move around? Oh, it, it does move around. They can move around. Anywhere. We're doing some specific experiments right now with this array. So these are actually in a location where we want it to be. What we're trying to do is we're trying to see if we can unlock um, the connection between a small area where listeners are likely to be and compare that to the average response in the room. Mm. Um, there's several ways we can get the average response in the room relatively easy with really smart mathematics. Um, but to get the average response in a very specific area is actually really difficult. So if we can since we know how to get the average response in the room, is there a way where we can find the average response and then and guess what the response might be where the listeners are, maybe using artificial intelligence or other ideas, mm. and therefore make a self-adapting speaker that really adapts properly to the room mm. without the customer having to do these microphone measurements. Uh, results so far are encouraging, but uh, not perfect. It's still in the works. Still in the works. Well, Alan, thank you so much for having me. Jay, it has been an absolute pleasure. It's uh, fun to see another Canadian audio file again. Well, I'll make sure to visit again. Yeah. Take care, man. Until next time. Safe to say, visiting Samsung's audio lab really opened my eyes to what may be coming in the future. As an audio file, I've always had preconceived bias that sound bars were just not good enough. But the demo I heard and seeing Samsung's facility firsthand told a different story. It was an understatement that they were taking this seriously. And not only that, they were all music lovers at heart that truly wanted to create something amazing for every music lover or movie lovers out there. Not sure if you caught it, but Alan was talking about utilizing artificial intelligence in the future and they were working on that as we speak. There were a lot of hints throughout this video on what to come, so if you didn't catch them, I suggest watching it again while paying close attention to what Alan has to say. As my time in California comes to a close, one thing is clear in my mind. It won't be the last time you will be hearing about Samsung or their products on my channel.